Hey everyone, good morning um, and welcome to our APUSH stream this morning. I'm Robbie May, I'm an APUSH teacher in uh, Western Maryland. I also teach AP government and AP uh, world history and a class called World War II and Holocaust Studies and another class called Historical Research Methods. Um, I am a regular streamer here at Fiveable, but I'm also, I oversee all the humanity streams at Fiveable, so all the history streams and all the English streams. Um, so if there's something that you're like really, really wanting to, uh, us to stream on right now um, in any of those subjects, please just let me know. I'm more than happy to um, get with my streamers and get those topics added. So a couple just housekeeping things. Um, for those of you that are new to Fiveable and are joining because you know you right now, like more than half of the country, welcome. Um, a couple of things I'll tell you is uh, on uh, Fiveable, if you go to the APUS history page, you can find all the streams from the entire year and they're completely free, okay? So any stream from every period, from period one all the way up to period nine, both streams from this year and last year are there. So if you're at home and you're freaking out because you know the AP exams in May and you have no idea when the next uh, uh, time you're gonna be in school is, don't worry, okay? Uh, you can go on to Fiveable, you can find streams on just about everything, plus we have a bunch of upcoming streams as well too, some during the day and some at night to, to help you out, okay? Um, that, with that also being said, um, maybe you've heard this and maybe you haven't heard this, um, you might have been one of the students that this week got a uh, email from the college board. They just pulled probably a very small portion of students asking you about what you wanna do in terms of test um, and the test feature at the end of the year for the AP exam. That being said, today, there's gonna to be a big announcement out of the college board and explaining what they're going to do. Um, whether they're gonna do online testing, whether they're just gonna cancel the tests altogether um, and what's going to happen. Because I think that based on seeing your chat here, but I agree with many of you, I don't foresee school systems going back to school in the United States this year. I think a lot of you within the next week or so, your schools will be closed for the rest of the year, just like um, I'm kind of expecting that in my own district. So um, I don't know how technologically efficient your teachers are or if they're still keeping up with you. Um, but if not, don't worry, because we have tons and tons and tons of resources here on um, Fiveable. And I see some of you, you know, you're worried where you're at right now. Again, don't worry. I mean, in all honesty, now that you're home, you can can keep on going. Um, I would a couple things I'd recommend. So number one, you have fileable. But number two, in my students, many of them who are in the the room here with you right now, um, we utilize the AMSCO book. Um, you can it's just A M S C O. And so if you don't have that, I just get on Amazon and order it because it is going to be a very succinct. Um, review of all the important things that you need for the AP exam. And so I, I would just, after the college board makes its announcement today, I just go ahead and order one for yourself or at home if you don't already have one, because it's a great study tool. Okay, so I think that's all the, the housekeeping things that I wanted to, to go over with you guys. Um, this stream is gonna focus on the 1960s. And what I put um, on here, I see, or, hold on, I'll answer this question real quick, I see in the chat, about is Barron's okay? Um, Barron's is okay, but um, it's not going to give you as much detail as what you need considering you're completely out of school. Barron's is good for I've had all the content and um, now I'm just going back and like refreshing on things. AMSCO is really what you need to introduce you to the most important concept and to do it in a way that's really um, in, in plain English. It's only, I think the book is 18 bucks, so it's not very, very hard. Same with Princeton Review. All those other review books that are out there. AMSCO is the only one that's like a textbook. My students actually use it as our textbook. I hate all the other HP textbooks. Um, and so the AMSCO book is is very well succinctly written in summarized form. I mean, my students are in the room so they can chime into the chat and tell you what they think about AMSCO. But Barron's and Princeton and, and all those other prep, prep books, those are only really good if you've had all the content and you're just doing a refresh because they're very, very, very short with some of the, the big things. Okay, so what we're gonna be covering today is the 1960s. And what I said in the chat here just a little bit ago is that um, that I am not gonna be covering the civil rights movement. I actually just did a stream on that uh, on Fiveable the other day, probably, I don't know if it's Tuesday or Wednesday, everything's kind of going together. Um, and so I would say that 
Uh, if you need civil rights movement refresher, go to, to look at that one because in that stream and it's on Fivewell, I covered the African American civil rights movement, I covered the LGBT civil rights movement, I covered the women's civil rights movement, and the Indian civil rights movement, all which are, are part of this. Okay. Today we'll be covering everything else that's going on in the 1960s. So if there are things that you definitely want me to cover, just throw it into the chat. We I see Katie that you're asking about the Great Society. We will 100 percent be covering that in this chat. And as my students will tell you, it would not be the 1960s if I didn't talk about the Great Society because my favorite president ever is LBJ. So let's start with the election of 1960. Um, oops. So a couple of big significant things about the election of 1960, okay? Um, and so we have on the Democratic side, JFK, who's running, okay, who is one of the youngest people to ever run for office, okay? Um, but a lot of people are concerned because he's a Catholic, okay? And you probably, or you should know this from, from A Push already, the United States has a, a long history of nativism, okay? And specifically a distrust of Catholics because they thought they were papists, because they would take orders from the, the Pope. And so up until JFK, all of our presidents had been Protestants. Um, and so JFK is the first Catholic. And believe it or not, there are a lot of people that have concerns over that. On the Republican side, you get Richard Nixon, um, who is uh, kind of an incumbent because he was uh, um, Dwight Eisenhower's vice president during the 1950s. They run a, <coughs> a neck and neck campaign. Polling is very, very close. And it's really just one event that really gives uh, JFK the edge. To, can any of you tell me what that event was? I'll give you a second to, to write in the chat. Yeah, the TV debate, yep. So what ended up happening is you get the very first televised presidential debate in American history, okay? And um, television is this new medium. Millions of homes are starting to, to get TVs for the first time, and the candidates agree to this. Well, Richard Nixon, just prior to this debate, he had been very sick. He had been in the hospital. I believe if I remember right, he was recovering from pneumonia. Um, and also... Um, and also, when Richard Nixon came in, uh, uh, came to this debate, they offered him to uh, put makeup on, but he was like, no, I'm not doing that. Okay, well, today, anybody that's on TV knows, doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, you wear makeup on TV, okay, um, to cover up blemishes, to cover up, you know, sweat, things like that. JFK took the, the makeup, et cetera, and in general, the... Uh, there was a great divide. People that watched the debate live on television felt that Kennedy easily won that debate um, because he looked um, he looked well taken care of. He answered the questions appropriately, whereas as Nixon did not look good. Um, he had a five o'clock shadow. He was sweating. Um, he kind of was like dancing around a little bit, um, and people just thought he looked terrible and didn't look very uh, presidential on TV. Whereas the people that listened to it on radio thought that Nixon had won the debate. It was really interesting. But this election is really what threw it to, to JFK in what was a close uh, close time or close election. And so JFK ends up uh, winning that election. And Kayla, in terms of your question, um, it's really not part of what this, this presentation is about, but just to give you some context, in terms of uh, Eisenhower's presidency, the end of the Korean War, McCarthyism, the military industrial complex, those are all big pieces of the Eisenhower presidency. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the um, programs of JFK. So one of the things that you should be, I hope your history teachers have been pushing on you is in the 20th century, starting with FDR, each of these programs, or excuse me, each of these presidents come up with a program and they hit on their major legislative priorities. And so like FDR had a new deal. Um, then Truman comes along and can anybody tell me what Truman's uh, domestic program was called? Yeah, Truman's program was called the Fair Deal. Good, Mac. Um, and the Fair Deal had three parts to it, okay? Three big domestic policy issues that Truman really wanted to hit on with the Fair Deal. Can any of you remember that? Because that's going to be a continuity here in the 60s. Three big domestic policy issues that were part of the Fair Deal of Truman.
Yeah, healthcare and education were the two big ones. There's one more. Okay, yeah, uh, William, you've got it. Civil rights. Okay, so healthcare, education, and civil rights are the three big parts of the the fair deal. Okay, um, he failed on civil rights because he couldn't get Congress to go with him. He failed on health care because he couldn't get um, Congress to go with him on that. And he really wasn't able to get much for education either. Okay, The only thing that he was really able to do in terms of civil rights was um, desegregation of the military, but he did not have a Congress that really worked with him. So those programs got pushed on. Okay, The next Democratic president to come along is going to be JFK. And JFK, similar to FDR and similar to Truman, comes up yet with a program called the New Frontier. Okay, so it's going to push for a couple of different things. Okay, expansion of social welfare, which is going to be included with civil rights there. Okay, some environmental issues, the Clean Air Act, um, and as well as the Peace Corps. Okay, the Peace Corps is going to be established under JFK and it's still going to be a major part of the United States today. Of course, in his inaugural address, he gives that famous line, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Uh, because he really is looking at um, a more service-oriented uh, country. Of course, the decade's going to be thrown into turmoil because of the civil rights movement and because of Vietnam. So a lot of that kind of gets pushed to the wayside as well. In terms of him, when he comes into office in the civil rights movement, you have the, the freedom rides that are happening in the South. You have um, uh, Governor Wallace blocking the integration in the South of the schools. You have the March on Washington, all that's happening. And really, Kennedy is hesitant to get involved with this until, um, until uh, Martin Luther King gets put in jail and he writes the letter from Birmingham jail and, and JFK is really drawn to the elements of that letter, <coughs> which I talked about in that stream the other day and ends up saying, okay, we, uh, we really do need to do something with, with civil rights. And so he pushes for the civil rights act. But of course, JFK is going to be assassinated before that. In terms of feminism, Betty Friedan is going to write the feminine mystique. And that's really going to um, launch the civil, civil rights movement for, for women. So, of course, the Cold War continues to be a problem um, during the Kennedy administration during the 60s. And so each president really has to take his or her, well, I shouldn't say her, we haven't had a her, but his own um, take in terms of how to respond to this. So JFK um, really creates this cabinet of a lot of intellectuals, okay, and strong business owners. And so he taps the president of the Ford Motor Company, Robert McNamara, to be a secretary of defense. And for a push, there's not many cabinet officials, which I would say are really important to know, but Robert McNamara is definitely one that you should keep in mind and remember, okay, because he really is the, the one that is calling the shots at the beginning of the, the Vietnam War. So we're coming from <coughs> a place under Truman and Eisenhower where we had what was called containment theory. And the idea was that we cannot allow communism to spread. Okay, that was started under uh, Truman with uh, containing of communism um, in Korea and not letting it spread, it led to the Korean War. Uh, and then the other thing Eisenhower throws in there is the domino theory, okay? And the whole idea behind the domino theory was that um, just like a, uh, just like a, uh, when you have a bunch of dominoes that are set up, you press one down and the others keep going ding, 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 down, they all fall down. Um, that's his idea, that that initial domino was communism. And when one country falls, then the next country next to it's going to fall, et cetera. And, and Eisenhower said, we can't allow that to, to happen, okay? And so what Eisenhower says here is there are um, stages to our flexible, what he calls, or excuse me, not fle uh, Eisenhower, JFK, um, to flexible response, okay? So um, he ramps up the production of nuclear weapons. Of course, we now have the, um, we now have the uh, hydrogen bomb, um, but he also is um, 
cognizant of us not wanting to get into any kind of uh, nuclear war, okay? Um, and so the Eisenhower, or excuse me, I keep saying Eisenhower, the JFK response is flexible response. That Basically the idea and what you need to understand here is that we've got a couple different options of how we can deal with the Soviets, okay? And so we're going to have a flexible response in, in how we do that, okay? But we are going to increase our arms buildup. We are going to increase uh, our defense department, things like that. So one of the first um, foreign policy issues that Kennedy gets himself into is, um, is the Berlin Wall crisis. Now, we've already had one crisis in Berlin prior to this. What was the, the crisis in Berlin that we've already seen prior to this towards the beginning of the, the Cold War? Eisenhower with the blockade, wrong president, right thing. Who was the president for the blockade? Yeah, Berlin, the Berlin airlift, the Berlin airlift under Truman is who we're looking for here. Okay, so remember, um, early after World War II, Stalin had cut off um, United the United States and the other allies who had had half of Berlin from Berlin. Because remember, Berlin is part of East Germany, which is all Soviet territory, but they divided Berlin up between those victors of World War II. Well, Stalin decides to cut them off. Why? Because he wants them out of Berlin. Well, Truman basically puts a whole bunch of bombers in, uh, in Great Britain, and he also starts to fly in multiple times a day supplies to, to West Berlin. And Stalin eventually says, okay, yeah, the Ber we're going to allow you to open back up because he realizes that he can't win and he's, he's concerned that Truman is going to, to use those bombers to basically inflict damage on the Soviet Union. And so once again, under Kennedy, we get another crisis, okay? Um, whereas now we have a new leader, a new Soviet premier, because Joseph Stalin has had a massive stroke and died. Who's the new Soviet premier? Yeah, Khrushchev, okay? Khrushchev comes to, to power. Yeah, Nikita Khrushchev. I always like his first name. Like, I feel like it would be a great name if he had a pet, like Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev. Um, anyways, uh, so Nikita Khrushchev, same thing. He wants, he wants um, the United States out of West Berlin, okay? Kennedy ends up going to, to Berlin, and he gives this incredibly famous speech. And at the end of his speech, he has this phrase, which is there on the PowerPoint, PowerPoint Ich bin ein Berliner, okay? Which in German just means, I am a Berliner. And the German people just fall in love with the idea that basically JFK is saying, like, hey, I'm here, we're going to support with you, I'm standing with you because I am one of you. So the Soviets end up um, constructing the Berlin Wall, which is a fortification that literally divides East and West Berlin, okay? And no longer would you be able to cross from one side to another. So literally, there are families that are completely separated that won't see each other again until the Berlin Wall falls in 1988. Um, and the Soviets are going to do their thing in their territory, and the uh, American and their allies are going to do their things in their territories. And the Berlin Wall comes up, and it just becomes this physical wall. Now, if you've never been to Berlin, um, I've been to Berlin before. <coughs> the wall itself is probably, I don't know, about 12 feet high. Um, it's gone now, uh, but there are small segments of it that they've remained uh, allowed to remain up as kind of like museum artifacts. Um, and there was one point really between the east and west where um, you could go between the two areas if you were military or something um, was Checkpoint Charlie, okay, kind of in the center of, of Berlin. But it's fascinating to see even today what East Berlin looks like compared to West Berlin because West Berlin is very modernized. It is very developed, whereas East Berlin – it's not, even still to this day, because of Soviet control during that time. Now, just real quick, I saw uh, a question on here about 
Why did Jeff or what did JFK JFK do in regards to the Twenty Third Amendment? Um, I'm not really sure where your question is coming from because the Twenty Third Amendment is about the um, District of Columbia getting a uh, vote in the Electoral College, um, and I. I don't know of any connection between the two. There may be, but I can tell you just right off the top of my head, um, it's not anything you're going to see on the, the AP test. Um, and then I just saw another question come in. Did JFK cause any major conflict in the United States under his presidency? Was he overall a beneficial president and progressed um, our country? So it sounds like you're giving me your homework question. Um, and I'm not going to answer your whole homework question for you. I would say that um, really you need to, to look at your your whatever your book is that you've got there. Um, and there's lots of things that you can say there. That's an interpretive uh, question. And so as we go throughout the PowerPoint today, you're probably going to get some of the answers that you can can use there for your for your homework. So, OK, um, going on. So Berlin crisis is averted. JFK is um, considered, you know, he made some good moves there, although we get the Berlin Wall. Now, the big blunder of JFK's presidency is the Bay of Pigs, okay? And it's probably the most embarrassing uh, moment in his presidency. Not long, uh, he's been about in office for about a year at this point. So basically at this point, if you go back to the, trace the history here, let's go back to the Spanish-American War. So what happened to Cuba at the end of the Spanish-American War? Can someone tell me what happened to Cuba at the end of the Spanish-American War? I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. Right, yeah, Mac, absolutely. They were independent, okay? And so, from Spain. And so what ends up happening is Cuba is now their own independent republic. Um, but... The problem is someone comes to power in Cuba and kind of irritates us a bit. Who comes to, to power? Fidel Castro, correct. And so when Castro comes to power, we basically lose the influence that we had on Cuba. So Castro comes to power and Castro is heavily influenced by the Soviets. And so we see that as a problem. However, it's not a stop the world moment um, problem. But we are super concerned that if something's not done in Cuba, then Cuba is going to fall to communism. It's that whole idea of the domino theory of uh, Eisenhower. So what ends up happening is JFK and his military advisors are sitting down thinking about what can we do about Cuba. And the whole thing is, is like, well, we don't really want to uh, – we don't really want to um, – have a direct military intervention because we didn't do so hot at that in Korea and it's not really something that's popular with the American Republic. So instead we have this new organization called the CIA and the CIA is basically in the background being like, ooh, choose me, choose me, choose me. So JFK looks to the CIA and basically authorizes the CIA to train Cuba, Cuban exiles who are living in the United States to then go back to Cuba and overthrow Castro's uh, regime there. So the idea is that um, we would land these, uh, we would provide these uh, exiles after we've trained them. The CIA would provide them with transport via the Navy, okay? And we would land them at Bay of Pigs, okay? And I don't know why it's called that. It's just the geographical name of the, the area, okay? In, in turn, we would support them with an aerial assault of U.S. bombers, okay, and then a small ground invasion uh, force, okay. However, the entire operation ended up being botched, okay, and JFK decided not to use the bombers to support them, and all of a sudden, this operation that we had planned um, backfires on the United States, and the United States looks really, 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 really bad uh, internationally. And basically, the world, especially the Soviets, they um, spin up their propaganda machine, and they're basically saying, look, <coughs> the United States is now the one. They accuse us of trying to overthrow republics. Now it's the United States that are trying to overthrow republics. Um, and so it's an incredibly embarrassing moment, not only for JFK, but for the, um, the country as a, as a whole. So this operation, Operation Mongoose, 
um, which was using the, the Cuban exiles to overthrow Castro, ends up backfiring, ends up not working. Most of those exiles are killed when they invade Cuba, and the rest are, are thrown in jail. And it just, yeah, not a good way to start his, his foreign policy. Now, the uptick to that, though, is um, a year later, we get the Cuban Missile Crisis. So um, there's a really good movie on Amazon, and actually it used to be on Netflix, too, that while you're off, um, you can watch. It's called 13 Days, and it's very historically accurate, and it's actually a really good movie, too. It was just produced a couple years ago. It's about the Cuban Missile Crisis because it lasted for, for 13 days. So basically what happens is we have a U-2 plane, which is a spy plane, that we have flying over Cuba and is doing just regular reconnaissance of Cuba like we do on many Soviet countries at the time. And the plane comes back with its footage, and all of a sudden we see what appears to be nuclear missiles that are being um, sent into Cuba and being installed there. And when we see that, that is something that we are incredibly concerned about. Because now, all of a sudden, the Russians have a first strike uh, ability, meaning that they can uh, launch a nuclear missile from our backyard and really, um, for and you see it on this map on this PowerPoint here, within a few minutes, it can destroy almost any place on the, the East Coast over to, to Texas. Um, unlike when they just, the closest place before that they had missiles with the Soviet Union, and it would take 20, 30 minutes for a, a missile strike to actually strike the United States and would give the United States time enough to respond back. So Kennedy first uh, tells Khrushchev that the shipping of Soviet nuclear weapons to Cuba must stop right now. Um, and Khrushchev says, you know, oh, no, we're not, we're not shipping those. Well, they denied that. Okay, well, they basically took the evidence of the pictures and there were other things they had. They took it to the United Nations Security Council. Adlai Stevenson was our, our um, representative, our ambassador to the UN at that time. And he laid it out and basically, you know, caught the Soviets with their pants down in front of the Security Council. Okay, and the Security Council is going to support, um, or I should say the member nations, many of them, are going to support Kennedy's actions. So what Kennedy does is instead of calling for a direct assault on Cuba, which he is worried could cause nuclear warfare, um, Kennedy orders a quarantine uh, using a naval blockade. And basically, so many out miles out to sea around Cuba, they use the United States uh, Navy, part of them, to form a blockade and ensure that no Soviet ships get through. Meanwhile, they have Soviet ships on radar that are coming towards Cuba and are not stopping. Plus, there are also Soviet subs in the water. And so, basically, the whole world is watching this after um, JFK goes live on national television and tells the world what's happening. And everybody's just holding their breath because the Soviets are still going towards Cuba. The blockade's still there. And the thought is, is if the Soviets don't stop, once the blockade gets, or once they get to the blockade, the blockade's going to shoot on the orders of the president. And then you're going to have a war that's going to start. And it's probably going to be a nuclear war. So people literally were panicking across the United States because this is the closest moment in the entire Cold War where we actually came to, nu uh, to nuclear war. What ends up happening is those Russian ships get right up basically to the bowels of the blockade. And Khrushchev gives the order to stop and to turn around. Um, Khrushchev basically doesn't call Kennedy on his bluff. Um, and really, at the end of the day, Kennedy doesn't want a war any more than what Khrushchev wants. So as a result, um, the missiles are removed from Cuba. Okay, But the agreement that Kennedy makes with Khrushchev is that we will, in turn, remove our missiles from Turkey and Italy. So because those are right on the doorstep of, of Russia. So Russia removes theirs from Cuba, and we remove ours from Turkey and Italy. The second thing is that we promise that we will not invade Cuba. Okay, so basically we'll let Castro do his thing. And finally, um, they're going uh, to install in the Oval Office of the White House and at the Kremlin in Russia a hotline, like a red phone between the two. So if there's any emergency communication that needs to take place at any point, the president and the premier of Russia can communicate right away. And so that's the Cuban Missile Crisis. <coughs> Just a couple quick things about um, Kennedy's new frontier here. 
Um, lots of initiatives that are proposed here, many of which are our past. So he proposes a tax cut to encourage private investment. So basically that, and today we would consider that very much a Republican idea, uh, that you are going to cut tax and people are going to use that extra money they have now to spend on other things. Um, he is going to push for poverty alleviation, but that's not really going to happen and it's going to be LBJ who's going to pick that up because of his um, his uh, assassination. Same with education, same with civil rights, and um, the one thing that does happen under him is the increased funding for the space program. Because JFK makes this speech at a college in, um, I want to say it was in Texas, and he says, by the end of the decade, we shall go to the moon. Well, the newly created agency, NASA, hears that speech, and they're like, excuse me, um, can someone just tell me what he just said? Um, and they're like, yeah, he just said we're going to the moon, and everybody's staring at themselves. Understand that at this point, we really hadn't even gotten a rocket to successfully launch off of the platform. Every time we tried to launch a rocket at the Kennedy, well, it's not the Kennedy Space Center yet, but at the Space Center in, in Florida, it blows up. So, yeah, not going so well in our space program. And so as a result, NASA's like, well, this is interesting. The president has just told us that we're going to send a, a man to the moon before the end of the decade. And it's 1962 right now. And we can't even get a rocket to go up into uh, to space off the platform. Yeah, that's kind of a problem. So as a result, um, NASA gets a major, 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 major budget increase, billions and billions and billions of dollars. Now, the Russians are ahead of us in the space race because in the 1950s, the Russians do something in terms of space that scares the crap out of us in the United States. And what is that? Sputnik. Yep, yeah, Sputnik. They launched Sputnik, and that scares the absolute crap out of us because – People are like, oh, my God, does that mean they can launch a nuclear weapon from space? How are the Russians ahead of us? And so this is a, an Eisenhower thing. Oh, boy, Kayla, the College Board just released info. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to pause the, the chat with you guys here. Or I'm going to be on the chat, but I want to see what the College Board said. Kayla, feel free to, to add or give a link. Just on eight nine. It's only one through seven. Well, that's kind of good. Um, where are you seeing that at, Kayla? I'm like doing a quick Google search here. Oh, I just got an email. I wonder if that's it. Nope, that's not the College Board. If anybody else has a link to anything. Send it to me here real quick. Why look up? Okay. okay, I found it here. I'll just read it to you guys. It says, "Though our members across the country, or, through our members across the country, we understand that the new time constraints on everyone in the education community." These solutions are meant to be simple and lightweight as possible for both students and teachers without creating additional burdens for school leaders during this time. Traditional face-to-face -face administration will not take place. Some students may want to take the exam sooner rather than later while the content's still fresh. Other students may want more time to practice. For each AP subject, there will be two different testing dates. The full exam schedule, specific resources, Types that will be uh, on each AP exam and additional testing details will be available by April 3rd. Um, they'll unlock any relevant free, free response questions in AP Classroom for digital use so students have access to all the practice questions. Um, I'm just looking at the next part here. Students remain eager to take AP exams and have a chance to earn credit and placement. Um, they surveyed 18,000 AP students and found out 91% indicated that they want to compete or complete this important step. Um, uh, next month, following place. Um, for the 2019-2020 exam administration, students can take a 45-minute online exam at home. Educator-led development committees are currently selecting the exam questions that will be administered. Uh, let's see here. Colleges support the solution and are committed to ensuring that AP students receive the credit they have worked hard this year to earn. 
Students will be able to take these streamlined exams on any devices and have they have access to, computer, tablet, or smartphone. Taking a photo of handwritten, handwritten work will also be an option. We recognize the digital divide for some low income and rural students for participating while working with partners. We will invest with or so that these students have the tools and connectivity they need to review AP content online. Uh, let's see here. The exam questions are designed and administered in a way that prevent cheating. We use a range of digital security tools and techniques, including plagiarism detection software to protect integrity of exam. Scoring at homework for an AP exam is not new to the AP program. For years, AP programs are received and scored at home student work um, as a part of computer science and AP capstone. And then it goes specific. So for A push, it is saying, um, yep, yeah, it will just, uh, it will not cover units eight and nine. So basically you will be tested up through the Civil War on that. Um, and you will only be tested on periods one through seven. Um, it looks like, uh, I'm just looking at the exam format here. Oh, the exam format, they said they're not gonna post until the third. So of April. So that's what's happening with the AP exam right now. Give me one second here. I just want to send this off to people. Okay, so, okay, let me finish up here with uh, the 1960. Um, in terms of my students who are, are doing this, yeah, we're, we're, we have to still stick with the curriculum, so we're still going forward, okay? Um, I'll end up texting you guys later so and, and talk about all that stuff. Um, but, yeah, so let's keep on going here. So um, space program, majorly funded uh, as a result, and of course, by the end of the decade, we will get to the moon. Just in time, July of 1969, we end up uh, getting to the, to the moon. Uh, in terms of his opposition, he is continually to be opposed by his own Democrats in the Senate, specifically what we call the Dixiecrats um, from the South, the Southern Republicans, who could continue to oppose, especially like civil rights. So in 1963, JFK is in Dallas, Texas, and he is assassinated um, while he is um, going through an open motorcade in downtown Dallas. Um, he two, takes two different shots, one that goes in the shoulder and the other, of course, that goes to the head, and it's the fatal shot. Um, Lee Harvey Oswald is, of course, accused of that murder and is tried and convicted for that murder. Well, excuse me, no, he's not tried and convicted because he doesn't live long enough to be tried and convicted because... Um, uh, Oh, man. The the name has just slipped me. Now I've got all this stuff going in my head. Uh, Jack Ruby assassinates Lee Harvey Oswald, who you're seeing there in the PowerPoint picture. This is Jack Ruby assassinating Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald. Um, and there are tons of conspiracy theories around that. Um, there's lots of doubt about what happened. Uh, I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but there's lots of really strange things that I have, are unopened questions there. Um, and so... Anyways, going forward, the Warren Commission, and it's called that because Chief Justice Warren of the Supreme Court is the one who um, chairs that commission, investigates it, and basically comes out with a report that says, oh, yeah, there was only one shooter. It was Lee Harvey Oswald, yada, yada, yada. Okay, but a lot of people look at the facts and say, this doesn't add up. Um, and then the reason that we have, um, we have pictures of or video of his assassination is because of the Zapruder film. Um, because there's a man with the last name Zapruder who's filming JFK as he comes through the, uh, that area and he catches the whole thing on camera. I mean, you can find it on YouTube. It's a, it's a gruesome video, um, but that's how we have um, the video evidence of what happened. So coming into power is Lyndon Baines Johnson and um, Kennedy and he did not get along. Basically, Kennedy just added LBJ to the ticket because um, he needed someone from the South, and he needed a Democrat that had a, a big record of experience because he was from the North, and he didn't have a lot of experience. Um, and so that's why he tapped uh, LBJ, okay? 
And so LBJ is a um, formidable member of the United States Senate. He's a majority leader in the Senate, um, is from Texas, has long served uh, in Congress. He was a school teacher for poor immigrant children on the Mexican-American border. He had grown up poor himself. And he basically chosen to balance the ticket. But basically, that was it. He, this was a presidential, vice presidential relationship where Kennedy um, and LBJ did not um, speak to one another. Kennedy didn't really give LBJ anything to, to do uh, as a vice president. And so there was a lot of um, tough feelings between the two. So LBJ becomes president, uh, and he gets to work right away. One of the very first things that he does is he goes to Congress after JFK's death and he says, in honor of JFK, we need to pass the Civil Rights Act. And so in 1964, you get to pass the Civil Rights Act, which basically bans discrimination in the United States. OK, uh, no more separate but equal, no more segregation. It's all illegal. After the March on Selma, because uh, Martin Luther King told LBJ, we're not happy with that. Like, you need a Voting Rights Act. And LBJ is just like, you got to wait, you got to wait, you got to wait. He doesn't have a great relationship with Martin Luther King. Um, and so Martin Luther King goes to Selma, Alabama and leads a massive march. And it is caught on national TV where the Al Alabama state police are brutally beating these marchers. And people across the United States go crazy and demand that an end be put to this and that Voting Rights Act be passed. And so in 65, they passed the Voting Rights Act, which ensures Things like literacy tests and poll taxes, et cetera, all go bye-bye. Of course, they also passed the 24th Amendment to ban poll taxes. And it allows the Department of Justice to send people to the South to ensure that these, um, these elections are happening, happening fairly. Um, and so we still get that up until uh, today, okay? Um, you get the 25th Amendment as well, too, which is just presidential succession. Um, I don't really see that that is something huge that you need to, to keep in mind, okay? LBJ then launches into what he calls the Great Society. Um, his plan for all of these democratic things that have been trying to be passed under the Fair Deal, under the New Deal, under the Great, uh, or excuse me, under the New Frontier. And so civil rights is a major part of that. Education is another major part of that. So he gets the Elementary and Secondary Education Act passed, which is the first time in American history that the government has actively um, um, sent money, the federal government, to the poorest schools in the country. Okay, um, You get Head Start, which allows um, poor families to send their um, preschool age children to school or to preschool for free. Um, you, you get uh, the health care piece. He gets Medicare and Medicaid passed. So Medicare gives people over the age of 65 uh, health care, okay, paid for by the government. And Medicaid is for those who are in poverty and who can't afford health care. And then he also launches the War on Poverty, which is basically his program to eliminate poverty across the United States. And I'll put a little plug in our little uh, rural high school in Western Maryland. LBJ actually lands his helicopter on our football field, comes to the bottom of what we call the 52 steps um, into our stadium and gives this big speech launching the war on poverty and then goes throughout our town giving out these little gold cups um, that uh, people are supposed to put change in that they could donate then to, um, to like, you know, like, Union rescue missions and things like that to help the uh, the poor. I actually have one of those uh, cups in my classroom that he gave out here in, in Cumberland, where we live. So poverty, um, in terms of the number, you can see here the poverty rate as a result of the war in poverty drastically decreases in the 1960s and the 1970s, both the number and the poverty rate. Uh, unfortunately, you can see that that has continued to go up because many of LBJ's programs were, were ended once LBJ um, no longer was serving as president, or serving as president, which is a, which is a real shame. Um, but his war on poverty and great society did work. You can also see that the majority of the poverty in the United States to this day is still in the South. And we could spend the whole hour just talking about that and why that is. But these are these are issues in the South that started long before the Civil War, that were never fixed after the Civil War, and still continue to be a problem um, today. So this is just a slide of um, all the things that are established under the Great Society. Literally 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of legislative programs that are established by LBJ, okay? Um, the big ones I've, I've talked to you about already, and those are the ones that you definitely need to, to remember. Um, all these others are just uh, examples of other programs, um, but he is probably the most successful domestic policy president in American history. Okay, um, I'm just looking here because some of this I, I'm not going to go into as, as much. Um, that's so a couple things with the war on poverty. Um, this uh, Economic Opportunity Act or the Office of Economic Opportunity, that is a big one on the war on poverty. And it's big because it is a program to help give people and get people jobs, okay, which is the Job Corps is part of it. OK, um, Head Start, I've already talked about food stamp already uh, becomes a part of this and SNAP, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, especially for um, mothers, single mothers and uh, mothers with newborns. <coughs> Those all come about as a result of the Great Society and the war on poverty. Excuse me. With Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Anybody recognize who this is sitting next to LBJ at the desk as he signed the Medicare bill into law? Yeah, it's Truman, okay? And the reason why it's Truman, who at this point, and this is Beth, his wife behind him, um, is because Truman pushed for this as a part of his um, fair deal uh, and never was able to get it. And so LBJ actually flew to Missouri, to where Truman lived, Kansas City, Missouri, where Truman lived, and signed the bill there, and then issued Truman the very first Medicare card. Medicaid, the only difference between Medicare and Medicaid is Medicare is when you you can get, just like Social Security, after 65, whereas Medicaid, you can get at any age, and it's um, health care for low-income families. I've already talked to you about the, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. In 1964, um, LBJ is up against Barry Goldwater, and you can see here, based on the electoral map, he has zero problems winning this, okay? And LBJ sees this as a major victory because he wants to continue these domestic programs that he's had so much success with just in his first term. All those things that I showed you, those are all from his first term, which is kind of incredible considering that his first term in office is only about a year long, okay? Because JFK is assassinated in... 1963, the end of 1963. So he's incredibly successful. Um, with the Warren Court, I'm just going to briefly highlight this here. And all I'm going to say with this is that it is the biggest civil rights court in American history. Okay. I'm not going to really spend a ton of time going over these um, cases, but with Brown versus Board of Education, you get desegregation. Baker versus Carr, that's the one man, one vote with gerrymandering. Map versus Ohio, that's the, the one where they um, in, uh, ban evidence that is not already, um, that is not obtained with a search warrant. Gideon versus Rainwhite, where they get, guarantee you your right to an attorney. Um, Escobito, Escobito, don't worry about. Miranda versus Arizona, you get your Miranda rights, you're told your rights when you're arrested. Engel versus Vital, they ban prayer in school. Brandenburg versus Ohio, that even hate, uh, Hate groups like the KKK, they still have a right to free speech. Tinker versus Des Moines, that you still have a right to free speech in school. New York Times versus Sullivan, that's a free speech case with uh, the newspapers, okay? And then I think the last one on there is Griswold with privacy, and that's just the idea that, um, that you have a right to privacy under the Constitution. So Vietnam becomes the, the next big piece. And this is really what's going to kill um, LBJ. Um, LBJ would quote that uh, Vietnam is – that bitch of the war, Vietnam, is what killed the, the daughter that I most love, the Great Society. Um, and a lot of this is on bad advice that LBJ is given. Um, so North Vietnam, under the, the communist dictator Ho Chi Minh, invades South Vietnam, okay, under um, – Oh, boy, I always have fun trying to pronounce this, but it's no Diem Diem, okay, um, who's the um, Democratic leader in South Vietnam. But he doesn't really win any favors because he's in incredibly corrupt in South Vietnam, and a lot of the money that we send there it doesn't go to where it should be, okay? 
So at first, LBJ is told, well, let's just send military advisors and CIA operatives um, to Vietnam, which, you know, considering the CIA's record at this point, really not a great idea. But that's what he decides to do. Uh, and then they come back and they say, well, we need more advisors. Because initially they had sent less than 100. So then they send a couple thousand. Uh, and it's still going bad. And so the next thing they say is, well, we need a couple hundred thousand troops. What we end up getting is a major, major piece of legislation that's important to remember. And it is, no, I'm not going to say that again, Mac, but thanks. Uh, thanks for trying there. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, okay, which basically um, Congress never declares war, but they give pre the president the authority to use whatever military force he wants to in Vietnam. And the reason that that was given is because um, there had been an alleged attack on a, a U.S. military ship in um, the Gulf of Tonkin outside of off the coast of Vietnam, the USS Maddox, um, by Vietnamese torpedo boats. Um, and there's a back and forth uh, fight that happens there, but basically the president uses this to ask for the authorization for military force. Um, because President Johnson said this is an unprovoked attack. Um, really, at the end of the day, it wasn't that big of a deal, and very few people lost their lives. Um, but the Gulf of Tonkin resolution gives the president the opportunity to use whatever military force he wants to in Vietnam. It's basically a blank check from Congress. So he starts to um, roll up the... Um, the war and escalate the war. He appoints General William Westmoreland as the commander for the military in Vietnam, and they utilize Operation Rolling Thunder. Um, and it is a massive bombing of the North, okay, which is mainly jungle. And the problem is Vietnam is a different war than we've ever fought because the Viet Cong on the North are guerrilla um, guerrilla warfare tactics. They, they use guerrilla warfare tactics. Um, they live underground. They created booby traps all over the place. And so basically we just bombed the hell out of North Vietnam, but it doesn't do anything because they're not living in these villages. These Viet Cong are out in the, the jungles, et cetera. So then we start using chemical warfare. Um, we start to use napalm and Agent Orange. And of course today, many of our Vietnam vets have a permanent neuro neurological disabilities as a result. Today, kids in Vietnam are still being born with birth defects as a result of it. But basically what those were is the Dow Chemical Company gave us those. And the idea was that um, they would kill all of the vegetation so that we could basically see where these gorillas were at. Uh, and so we just killed thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of forest in Vietnam. But at the same time, we destroyed the land permanently because we we're basically using a pesticide on them, and it was why so many men that came back from Vietnam also have issues today. So Operation Rolling Thunder is the big bombing of northern Vietnam. We then get the Tet Offensive, which is the next big thing to remember about Vietnam. And it was basically coordinated attacks uh, in North, or, or excuse me, by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong uh, in the South, okay? This is their response to the rolling uh, Operation Rolling Thunder, okay? We are able to successfully counterattack, but we're right back at that same parallel <coughs> that divided North and South Vietnam before. This is very similar in many ways to the Korean War. Um, and so as a result of this, the American public starts to say, what the hell are we doing? Um, what is happening here? Why are we continuing to fight in this war? And so the anti-war movement really starts to begin in the United States. It really kicks off when we draft, okay, because now they're saying, well, we don't need 100,000 troops, we need 500,000 troops. Um, so, and people are starting to lose uh, confidence in LBJ. Uh, he's not able to get any of his domestic programs out of, um, out of uh, Congress as a result. So the draft begins in 69, um, and people just in general are, are not – are not in favor of this um, because now people are like, why are we, what are we sending our young men overseas to die for? What's the point of this? Okay. And then the last thing that I'll talk about with Vietnam here and, and the end of our presentation is the Hawks versus the doves in Congress. So you had the, the Hawks um, who were basically saying, um, look, we need to go at them. We need to get rid of the, the North Vietnamese. We need to do whatever we need to do 
to to get a victory in Vietnam, where the Dubs were mainly uh, nonviolent protesters, uh, Students for Democratic Society, which was one of the student college groups that came up uh, protesting the war, comes about. Martin Luther King comes out against it. Muhammad Ali comes out against it. Um, and so you get this massive debate. Um, and that really is where you, you get yourself into the 70s, which is a different presentation. So that's it for the 1960s that I'm going to cover today. Are there any questions that anybody has? Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining me. Check out Fiveable for all the other um, resources. In terms of what do you recommend for the AP test, Perla? What do you what do you mean in terms of what? Preparation and studying. Um, I, I'd go back to what I'd say at the beginning. Okay. I don't think you're probably going to see your teacher again, like at least in person. Um, I would recommend AMSCO and use, utilize an AMSCO now um, from periods one to seven to, to study for your for your test um, is what I would, would recommend for you. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would tell you. Uh, yeah. So, and William, your question is 100% correct. The Civil Rights of Act of 1964, this gets an AP Gov causes that massive realignment in the United States where the South now, um, and, and LBJ says when he signs the act that, look, um, I'm going to lose the South um, for the Democrats for a generation when he signs the bill. And that's what happens. Um, you get Republicans who then become Democrats and Democrats who become Republicans. Hence why the South today is solidly Republican and the, the North today is solidly Democrat. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for uh, joining me today. I hope you have a great time off. Check out all the resources on Fiveable, and I'll probably see you again on another stream in another day. See, see ya.